Hello, friends. My name is Michael Levine, and the show is titled Without Notes 2.0, The Zoom Sessions. We have decided, after nine years, to expand the show into a more national and international formatting, which, of course, is being done by Zoom. And we are here today with a very acclaimed and esteemed uh, author and uh, parental expert. John Rosemond is regarded by many as the world's foremost expert on the subject of parenting. He has been writing and talking about these subjects, I think quite prophetically, uh, for the last, I believe, three, four decades and uh, had one of the most successful syndicated newspaper columns in the world for some time, also on parenting. So, John, welcome to Without Notes. It's really an honor to have you on the show. Well, it's an honor to have been invited, Michael. Thank you very much. So, John, look, let's start with your background. Where were you born? Asheville, North Carolina, 1947. 1947, Asheville, North Carolina. A very different America uh, at that time. And uh, you live now also in North Carolina? I do. A rather circuitous route was taken, but uh, I ended up back here in North Carolina in 1974 I spent the first seven years of my life uh, in in pretty much the first seven years in Charleston, South Carolina. Right. Uh, believe it or not, in the historic district, which back then was the cheapest place in town to live. Right. Um, and ha had I met you uh, in your formative years, would you have appeared to have come from a Middle class home, a lower middle class home, or an upper middle class home? Oh, the first seven years, uh, lower middle class. My mother was a single parent for most of the first seven years of my life. We uh, lived in uh, what is called a cold water flat, uh, had no hot running water. When we needed hot water, we boiled water on the stove. Um, so lower middle class for those first seven years or most of them. And then my mother remarried. And my stepfather taught uh, at a medical school in Chicago. And so we graduated to authentic middle class, I suppose, at uh, that time. And do you have brothers and sisters? I have uh, five half brothers and sisters, uh, three of whom remain. And uh, so now you're living in Chicago in a middle class environment. Where do you go to high school, friend? Went to uh, Proviso West High School in Hillside, Illinois, um, a western suburb of Chicago. And uh, at the time, this was when the baby boomer generation, as you know, Michael, were, was flooding America's high schools. Uh, Proviso West uh, had a population, a student population of 5,000. Wow. That's quite a, quite a, a large uh, high school. I, I think my high school may have had about 1200 so that's quite quite large um now were you a good student john 
Uh, yeah, I was a straight A student. Was I a good student? Uh, no, I was very mischievous. Uh, I took every opportunity I could to um, to invent mischief for myself. It was my form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. All right. And then do you go to college? What uh, what becomes of you after high school? Uh, I go to Western Illinois University and um, promptly join a rock and roll band as their lead singer. And um, at the end of two years of college, my grade point average was a 2.1. I was two tenths of a point away from Vietnam. So you then did what? What, what became next in your story? Well, I met my wife. She came to hear my band play. She introduced herself afterwards, and uh, it was love at first sight. And I realized that uh, if I wanted to um, be an eligible spouse uh, for this uh, woman, that I needed to get my act together. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, uh, I rehabilitated myself as a student and probably began making straight A's again. And um, uh, we, my wife and I married the summer after she met me, we met, and um, she became pregnant on our honeymoon and delivered our first child when she was two months shy of her 20th birthday. So she was a teenage mother. We were living in a 40-foot-long single-wide trailer uh, with uh, uh, a driving a 1954 Ford Falcon station wagon that uh, started on most days. And, and what were you doing for work? How were you providing for this new emerging family? I was playing in a rock and roll band. Okay. We were, a, we were a working uh, rock and roll band. We were not a garage band. Okay. Um, we, uh, we distinguished ourselves in the early 70s by opening several times for REO Speedwagon. Oh, which, some of our audience will recognize. Yeah, uh, of course. In their very early days. And I tell people that was our brush with fame. However, the purpose of the opening act is to assure that the headliner sounds really, really good. <laughs> that yeah. is that is also <laughs> true. Yeah, so um, how long did you stay in your rock and roll brand, band? And then when did you make a pivot to your next adventure? Well, I continued to uh, support us playing rock and roll until I got into graduate school. I played rock and roll for uh, a grand total of seven years. And um, when my what wife... What instrument became, did you play? What instrument? I was a lead singer. Okay. I played guitar some. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a very theatrical lead singer, Michael. So um, uh, <laughs> Being a lead singer that likes to run around the stage didn't uh, work very well with a guitar strapped on. So um, I transitioned uh, to uh, being a blues harmonica player in addition to uh, being a lead singer. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after, I think, seven years of that, what do you uh, pivot to? What becomes your next Journey. Well, I'm in graduate school at that point, and I obtain a graduate uh, research assistantship for a psychology professor. And I get a part-time job working at a fast food joint and um, uh, graduate from graduate school in 1972 and uh, begin my career as a psychologist. And that is where your journey begins. And does your psychology work have a specialty? How, how do you 
begin to create a specialty around uh, parenting and parental information? Yeah, I um, uh, I was hired to direct a early intervention program, is what it was called in. 1976 in uh, the Charlotte area of North Carolina. And I began working with uh, families and uh, children uh, in that context. And um, I encountered a clinical social worker who uh, suggested to me uh, after reading some reports I had written, that uh, I turned my writing skills to writing a newspaper column. Oh. And she, her husband was the uh, executive editor of the local newspaper. And she went to her husband, and uh, her husband called me up and said, uh, my wife says, uh, you're interested in writing a newspaper column? <laughs> and I, I said, sure. And uh, so uh, he had me write five columns. I passed the audition and began writing my uh, newspaper column, which wasn't yet syndicated. It was syndicated two years later uh, in 1976. And... Um, I didn't realize it at the time, Michael, but I was the really the the one and only parenting columnist in America. I had no idea of that. Um, so the the column that you first started writing was a column dedicated to parenting. Yes. Okay, and that became your specialty, in which you ultimately became world renowned. Now, let's talk about what the implications for modern parenting have become in the society. You have been prophetic uh, at identifying things far, far, far beyond uh, before many others. You saw what I guess Winston Churchill referred to as a gathering storm uh, in the 70s. And many professionals at the time thought you were nuts or exaggerating. And I want you to talk about uh, how you came to conclude or what you observed in those early days that, again, I, I used the Winston Churchill gathering storm in the early 70s or the middle, middle 70s. What were you observing? Well, the epiphany came about as a consequence of problems my wife and I were having with our firstborn child. Uh, in January of 1979, we were informed quite matter-of-factly by his third grade teacher, who was a very good teacher, very professional, that our son was the, quote, worst behaved child she had seen in 20 years of teaching. Not welcome news. No, not at the time, but it really ultimately redefined my career trajectory. Okay. Uh, she told us that he was the worst behaved child she'd seen in 20 years of teaching. He was reading a year and a half below grade level. And she told us uh, there was no way she was going to promote him to the fourth grade and wanted us to know this in January so that we weren't uh, knocked over in June when sure. the news officially came. Three months later, she told us that she had witnessed a miracle that no one would have been able to convince her in January that our son was capable of such a sea change 
academically and behaviorally in the three months that had transpired. Um, he had gone from reading a year and a half below grade level, Michael, to reading at grade level. And he had gone from qualifying for four psychological diagnoses, attention deficit disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, bipolar disorder of childhood and a learning disability to being the most well-behaved child in the class. Uh, Mrs. Stewart called him a model student three months later. Wow. And uh, I began to realize that if my son, who was not outstanding intellectually, he was a smart kid, but he wasn't a genius. I tell people I'm the only parent in America, apparently, who's never raised a genius. <laughs> um, that is true, or at least one that acknowledged is Yeah. Um, I began to realize as a consequence of this experience that uh, everything I had learned in graduate school was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I had learned about children, everything I had learned about uh, proper parenting, uh, everything was wrong. That I had to, if I was going to straighten uh, out what had happened in my own family. And it was my responsibility um, that I was going to need to completely revise my understanding of children and child rearing. And so at that point, my newspaper column began to reflect this change in my attitude, my perspective. My profession turned on me like a pack of wolves. Um, prior to this, I had been good for business, and suddenly I became bad for business. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the next uh, several years, they attempted to uh, take my license away from me several times, all uh, because they did not like what I was saying. Mm -hmm. And what I was saying was that uh, our reliance on mental health professionals beginning in the late 60s, early 70s, when it came to child rearing, was backfiring on children. It was backfiring on families. It was backfiring on our culture. And um, I just refused to give in. And um, I, um, I experienced um, uh, cancel culture before pre, it was even... Pre-cancel culture, right. Yeah, before it was even a term. And mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things I point out to parents, um, I'm... I'm I'm a fairly busy public speaker. Uh, one of the things I point out to parents as often as I can, Michael, is that since we began listening to psychologists, people like me and other mental health professionals tell us how to raise children, that the mental health of children has deteriorated by a factor of 10. Wow. And that may be a conservative estimate. That's based not on guesswork. That's based on verifiable statistics. What was it that the psychologists were peddling in the 70s that became so noxious and toxic to an entire a generation of young people and then to a society at large in the 80s and 90s, what did you witness? What was what, what were they peddling that to, turned out to be such a poisonous brew? High self-esteem. Wow. I'm a member That's of the last generation of American children uh, who were raised by parents who felt that uh, humility was a virtue. 
I tell parents, uh, I'm a member of the last generation of American children who, who weren't allowed to have high self-esteem. Uh, you'll remember this, that when you had an outburst of high self-esteem in the 1950s, uh, your parents told you that you were acting too big for your britches. Yes, this is, this is, these are phrases not used today. But then we went to an even more toxic brew, which was uh, we pivoted from uh, the high esteem to participation trophies. And let's talk about when that begins. When does everyone uh, become uh, worthy of a trophy? Well, it's really not uh, a pivot. Uh, the idea that uh, children should receive participation trophies is very much in line with the idea that high self-esteem is the key to positive mental health in children. And I, I would like our listeners to understand that um, all of the good research that has been done into people with high self-esteem indicates that high self-esteem is for the average person who possesses a glut of self-esteem. It is a pathological feature. Uh, people with high self-esteem tend to be verbally abusive when they don't get their way or physically abusive. Um, they uh, tend to experience, because the world does not affirm their self-image, they tend to uh, experience regular episodes of debilitating depression, social anxiety, uh, and yet, my profession, knowing this, Michael, here's, here's the huge irony. Uh, my profession, knowing this, this, this research is available. It's available to even the average Joe on the street on the Internet. Uh, continues to promote the idea that high self-esteem is a desirable functional characteristic. Um, it's one thing to say, well, I, I feel like I'm capable of making a valuable contribution to society and I'm going to do my best to be a good citizen and I'm going to do my best to demonstrate love of neighbor. It's quite another to have or possess an overwhelming love of self. And, uh, okay, so my profession is now denying and has been for the last uh, 20 or 30 years that they really didn't mean that uh, uh, children should be rewarded for um, uh, participation and things like that. Right. Um but that is, if you read the stuff that was coming out of my profession in the late 60s and, and 70s, that is exactly what they were saying. They were saying that high self-esteem is key to a child's mental health. Well, no, it's not. Uh, they were saying that high self-esteem is key to uh, uh, excellence in, in school. Well, no, it's not. People with high self-esteem consistently underperform on tasks because, John, yeah. I, I want to I wanna pivot now to the conversation that's contemporary in nature, and that is when people see behavior on television frequently in American cities, Behavior that is clearly antisocial, clearly uh, self-destructive, robbing, uh, shoplifting stores brazenly. Now we're seeing 
a phenomena that 30% or so of the mob are women, often minorities, not always, but often minorities. What in the God's name has become of this anti, where did this anti-social, who was raising these children to not know that stealing is wrong, that uh, treating authority with disdain is is wrong. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, two out of every three children in America will spend significant time in a single parent household. And uh, that figure uh, goes up uh, when we're talking about minority groups. Right. Uh, these individuals, these young people who are burning and looting, as Bob Marley put it, yep. uh, are, are more often than not, far more often than not, products of fatherless homes. Right. And the research is very, very clear, Michael, that uh, being raised in a fatherless home for both boys and girls, but this is especially so for boys, uh, is, is toxic. That it predisposes young people to antisocial behavior. Yeah. How did it metastasize? Metastasize is a medical term for how did this cancer grow? How did a once stable family become a family in which women become pregnant, uh, unmarried women become pregnant regularly, and there is no social stigma attached to it? Where where did this emanate from, from your perspective? The Great Society is where it emanated from, Michael. Um, in the 1960s, part of uh, the civil rights legislation that was coming out of Washington involved laws that rewarded Black mothers for not marrying the fathers of their children. It was called the Aid to Families with Dependent Children Act. And uh, the government is what crippled the black family. And uh, we are paying a heavy, heavy, heavy cultural price for uh, the great society. And by the way, some of these programs may well have been born of good intention, but it brings forth the notion that the path to hell is paved with good intention. Now, John, we are in a dire place. Any person living in a major urban area in America can speak without hesitation about the dire nature of our society break, of societal breakdown. When people are free to uh, beat police officers, brazen during the middle of the day, there is no fear of consequence. Is there a path of redemption uh, that makes our future a bit more bright, or have we now passed a point of no return in your estimation? Well, I'm not a pessimist uh, by nature, Michael. I, I think there is a, uh, a path back, but uh, it's going to require uh, I think, for people to get behind what is going to be necessary in order to uh, restore health to our culture. 
because we are a sick society at this point. Oh, uh, that, that is un unquestioned. Mm. The path back is one that, under normal circumstances, uh, a sizable number of people are not going to accept. It's going to, in my estimation, require a crisis, uh, unfortunately, for us to realize uh, this has gone far enough and has to but be. But, John, correct. isn't the crisis upon us? The crisis, uh, yeah, it's upon us from your point of view and from my point of view. But the crisis... Oh, has forget about my point of view and your point of view. Let's talk about empirical point of view. If we are not in crisis today, what would need to happen to, to, to be legitimately... Referred to as a crisis. If this isn't a crisis, what would need to happen? The crisis needs to uh, needs to invade the white suburb, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the crisis has not invaded the white suburb quite yet. Okay, I see what you're saying. You're saying that as long as you can live in the suburbs of Chicago. The hell with this inner city, and they can kill themselves as much as they choose or not. But as long as it doesn't affect me in the suburbs, I'm going to go along to get along. As long as it doesn't affect you in the suburbs, it's a them phenomenon. And when it begins affecting you, it becomes an us phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And until it becomes an us phenomenon, Michael, uh, too few people are going to be motivated to really do what has to be done in order to um, rehabilitate America. One last question, John. I see parents today involved in parenting in a way that I, I don't recognize. It seems that many parents are on a mission to become their child's friend, not their parent. Can you talk about what you believe to be the horrific consequences of parenting as a, as a tool of friendship as opposed to uh, uh, child-rearing? Well, it was my profession, once again, Michael, that encouraged this uh, transition between the understanding in the 1950s and before that uh, parenting was a leadership function to the understanding that began to infect America in the 1970s uh, being that parenting was all about establishing a wonderful relationship with your child. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm writing a Substack essay right now in which I point out that uh, today's parents want to be their children's friend. Yes. And uh, however, on the other hand... And they want to be their children's friend, and they want to be popular, and they want to be well-liked. They're often from not always, but often from divorced homes in which there seems to be some type of arms race between both parents <laughs> to who can be better liked. Is that a Precisely. fair? Yeah, so on the one hand, they want to be their child's friend. And on the other hand, they want their child to obey. And I point out to parents what I should never have to point out, which no one should have to point out, but we've completely lost our common sense in this country. And that is, if you want your child to be obedient, which is, by the way, according to the research, very, very good for, ch for children, uh, the happiest children are the most obedient children, 
Uh, if you want your child to be obedient, then you can't afford to be working toward the primary purpose of having a wonderful relationship. Not that you should have a bad relationship, but my parents were not trying to have a relationship with me. They were trying to train me to become a functional, responsible citizen. And we've got to restore this ethic in the raising of children, Michael, or, you know, you called me a prophet earlier. Well, my prophecy, I'll dare to say it, even though I flunked fortune telling in graduate school, uh, is this country, its days are numbered. Mm. Well, and, there's no, and there's no other country out there that's going to take our place. Mm -hmm. Well, that is a, uh, a dire warning and one that may well need to be heard. Um, because when you look at the challenges that we face, uh, one can reasonably ask the question, how does this end? How does this end? John, thank you uh, very much for being a guest on Without Notes 2.0, the Zoom sessions. This is a uh, will be viewed all over the world. And I think that many people will find what you have to say most interesting and provocative. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you for your good work over the last 40 years. John, how can people learn more about you should they be tempted based on this conversation? Thank you, Michael. I, uh, I have two websites. Uh, okay. One is John Rosemond. Dot com and the other is parentguru.com. Great. And they can uh, uh, look at your material there and learn more. I commend it to you. Uh, whether, uh, ladies and gentlemen, whether you agree with all of what John said, most of what John said, none of what John said, or some of what John said, I think this conversation is one worth having and one worth considering. My challenge to this audience is this. I'd like you in the next 30 days to think about some of the things that uh, Dr. Rosemont said today and how do they apply in your own life and whether they're inconvenient or uncomfortable, how true are they? Uh, my name is Michael Levine, and I look forward to our next edition of Without Notes 2.0, the Zoom sessions. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm.